what is the template exactly? What is it? I've done a number of videos on it, but I do so many videos and I do so many, I, I learn new things and I make new videos and the stuff gets superseded and it, and it becomes very difficult to navigate my channel. And I know that, um, Tom, I'm going to get to that in this video and I'm going to try to consolidate it in a way that I just really cut to the chase. I know as I do this, I keep going back and showing people, this is, we emerge from the background and here's how we get there. We interpret this, we interpret, I need to quit doing that because it gets too long and just say, here's what it says. We emerge from this, we show up this way. There's cause, there's effect, there's cycles, that, you know, kind of go through. There's, there's one critical place in the beginning that we need to get to. We need to establish a place very firmly. And I'm going to get to that in this video. My name is Dan Paulson. Everyone, welcome to the channel. And let's go ahead and get started on that. The template is based on human life. And without going back in the material again and saying how I get this, let me just say, pay attention to what I'm saying and think about your own life and understand that this is the template that they're basing the stories on. And let me reword that in a very stark way. Creation in Genesis is about the birth of each one of us. Both of those two creation stories tell us things about ourselves and how the story network is going to unfold. Now, what I've got here is the template in mentally interactive terms. And I've got the first one right there identified. And you'll see that right now I've only got seven steps identified, and that's going to be critical. As we move along, we're going to see why that is so. That seven right there is going to be a point that is identified in a template, a monomyth template that's going to be a beginning. All this stuff up, up front, though, is important to know. So number one is that we're born from the universal energy. We exist within the framework of natural laws. There's nothing supernatural in these, um, in this material. If you maintain supernatural in the interpretation, you will not find a way to mentally interact with it. Everything within the cosmos is in cycles. That's just the way energy moves. So nothing within an energy structure can exist without there being in energies. If there's stuff riding waves, what is it going to do? It's going to be in waves or it's going to be on waves. We are in cycles. Everything cycles. Life cycles, the solar system, everything, the, the universe itself. The experiences that we have is what the issue is going to be. What it is when we look at this, why it's important to us is that we're going to learn that the issues that we have in life are going to be also moving in cycles. And then that's how we recognize them. All experiences due to cause and effect. The things that happen to us um, are going to, well, everything is due to cause and effect. Nothing just randomly occurs. There's things happening that make things happen, that make things happen, that make things happen. So whenever we see something happening in the world, when we see a physical action and we attached to it. We adjudge that. Um, we're not seeing that there's a whole process going on. We're becoming part of a problem when we do that. We cannot attach to something when it's just cycles repeating over and over again. We have fixed qualities at birth. That's in our DNA. That doesn't emerge in all the material, but it emerges in the first creation story in Genesis. That fixed qualities at birth, those are the things that we have that are like our personality traits, uh, that, you know, the kind of, the kind of person we're going to be, what our interests are going to be like, uh, sexual orientation, all of those things. There's a certain set of parameters that we're born with that are non-malleable, non-malleable. Then we grow till we're self, we're, till we are self-aware. What I'm describing here is that in the beginning, we're born, we're, we're come from the background cosmos for a number of years. We don't know anything. We're not self-aware. You need to live, but you don't know that. You, you're, we're going to cry. We're going to do things. Somebody has to know we need to be fed. We need to be burped. We need to be changed. We need to be cleaned. We rely completely on somebody else and we don't even remember it. We're, we're not self-aware at that point. We grow till we are self-aware. And then we begin to develop our identity through our experiences, where we come from. We are now conscious. I now, I, I am learning things. I am no longer just crying and I don't know why I am now crying because I'm hungry. And then as time goes on, I'm hungry and I want a banana. And I know that that banana is sweet and that it's a fruit and that it's yellow. And we begin to learn things here that are just a part of us beginning to grow the brain network necessary for us to be self-aware. We're growing to, we're self-aware here. We begin to develop our identity through our experiences and our basic skills. Uh, basic skills is probably, I should take that out of there. Through our experiences, where we come from and what we go through in life is going to determine kind of the quality we are. I think that they knew this and they figured this out. They could take slaves from one place to another and, 
you know, raise up somebody and go, you know, this infant over here from the far distance, it talks just like us, thinks like us, believes like us, everything else. They're not even the same color we are. How did that happen? They are realizing that there's something that that person had fixed in there, but depending on where they were raised, they were malleable and became something different. We need to know that too. We need to know that we are products of our own environments. That's why this is important to be here. But at point seven, we begin mental awareness of our experiential life right here. We're happy and not yet attached to any real world experiences. This is our place of personal bliss. We want to return to this state. What I'm going to suggest is that all of the material is going to somehow reference getting to a point here of inner peace again. This right here, this step right here is in life, in the personal life, before we begin having life experiences. We're still young. We're still kids. We're still happy. We're still playing. That is what is happening right here. That number seven right there is going to be a point that in the material, it's going to want us to go back to this point in time right here where the real issue that continually emerges is that we had not yet judged life. We had not been naming the quality of our life experiences, storing them away as memories with their emotional state of what they are at that point. But as we do, depending on where we come from and depending on those experiences and depending on how we perceive and process those experience, we experiences, we begin, we begin to live through those unknowingly and we become it, our life is a product of our continual experiences and the emotional state that we're holding there. And that happened because of what is going on. Well, that's going to happen after first sin. Right here, though, that hasn't happened yet. What this right here kind of signifies is the beginning of our life, the beginning of our conscious life. We were born, we were raised, we have all those other things going on. We're going to live a life of cause and effect that our continued experiences are going to be based on what we've stored inside of us. And it's going to be cyclical. And all of that are parts of what the beginning of the story teaches us. But what we want to get back to is this point. This is really before we, we began to experience life out in the world. You know, we were still very innocent and young at this point. We had not, you know, at this point in time, you could go to bed and have things okay. We'll make it all right. It'd be all right. Then later on in life, things are happening that you go to bed and it's like, I can't make that all right anymore. Something's really bad. I'm starting to accumulate things. I'm starting to not be in this state of, of mind anymore. I'm losing that. Um, and then life goes on. If, if you, uh, Jason and the Argonauts again, what is he supposed to go get? He's supposed to sail to the far side of the world. That's his world to get the golden fleece. He's, and then once he gets the golden fleece, he can rule the kingdom. That would be like here saying, you need to travel back to day seven, get your earlier self, and then you can live your life free of the things you've attached to again. That is what is the, the similarities that, that are kind of hard for some people to see. Um, they're, they're conceptual. When you look at the stuff a lot, you can begin to see that kind of thing there. Seven, you know, the gospel of Thomas. Um, I, I, I'm going to paraphrase here, but, uh, you know, let a man seven, let a man old in years, uh, ask a child seven days old where, the beginning of life is, and he will find that we're going, they want us to get back to this point. The seven right here is going to be a reference point. The gospel of Thomas verse four, Jesus said, the man old in days will not hesitate to ask a small child seven days old about the place of life and he will live. There's that seven again. Okay. And the seven is going to be in Abrahamic material. I don't know if it's going to be in Islam. Uh, I don't know if it'll be in the Quran. I do know that it is in Christian material and in Jewish material. It establishes that and it maintains that. However, the seven would be too common. They can't keep going back. At seven, seven also represents a place in the, that would be like the Garden of Eden. Um, what do we know about that? That the Adam and Eve, that is our conscious and our subconscious, are naked and unashamed. What that means is that we are not covered with anything. We have not had those life experiences yet. We're that happy kid. We're in the Garden of Eden. We're in a happy place on day seven. So we have Eden and seven. And let me continue to reiterate that Eden and seven represents a mental, a peaceful mental state before we attached. This is a free self. These numbers are becoming, I call them analogs. They're analogous to something different that plays out in the psyche. In fact, I realize now the best thing I can do is keep making comparisons. Think Buddhism, if you're aware of that, and we're, we're attached, we know that life contains suffering and the suffering is happening because we cling on to things and life is about trying to get rid of all those things that we're 
to get rid of our clinging. We may not get rid of the things. We have to get rid of the way that we mentally hold on to them and we're seeking nirvana. Jesus is going to say the kingdom of heaven within. This right here is that same place. Almost. There's one difference. Eden 7. There's a bit of a reference in here to get back to this point. There's one caveat. We don't, we don't ever actually get back to Eden. It's blocked off with a sword and a cherubim. You can't get back into it. And the reason is, is because if you think about it, at that point in time in life, you are happy, unattached, and blissful kid. You have no concept of what the world is. Now you're seeking that place again, that kind of detached part with one difference. This time you know about the world. You have to find a way of letting go of the things that you're holding on to. Back then, you hadn't started holding on to them yet. What's also happened in this material that we're not aware of at this point is that there is a mental hierarchy beginning to develop. There's going to be a God, a higher self, a higher higher awareness. It's not a self. It's a, it's an awareness. I don't know exactly what it is. I know that it's a mental place that I can experience in my imagination, if nothing else. And that is a place where I feel detached from my experiences. And then, but I get sucked right back into feeling those experiences. That's my conscious self. And then when I was young, I didn't have a subconscious self really developed. Everything was happy and good. Now I've stored stuff in there through life and it's hurt. That is the inner being right there. That's the female part. The male has been in charge of the female. And the female is now acting out and sinful. Boy, that sounds horrific as an analogous thing. But in the hierarchy, mentally, that is what is happening. The consciousness is in charge of what goes into the subconscious. And then throughout life, the subconscious continues to act out and the conscious has to re-experience it. So there's the sin, the repeating, all of that stuff going on. So all of that is also built into the stories. Now, I'm leaving out a lot of explanation, like I see two creation stories and I don't want one to be in front of the other and be mixed up like that. They're parallel. They they sit side by side. They're both creation stories that get to a little bit different place. One of them has the five rivers and talks about the, what is Eden? That's the flow of life. Five rivers, the, the higher being, the consciousness, the subconscious, all the qualities that we hold inside. There's the four rivers. And then there's the fifth one that goes to Eden that waters everything else. That's the flow of life. That's from our happiness to us. That's the flow of life that we live within. How is your life experience? Where are you and what is your day-to-day experience? That is all because of the flow of life that we're in that is because of where we came from and what we're holding and maintaining up here. I'm going to keep making a few parallels as I go along here um, just to continue to shore this up for people. It's good to build these little networks, these cross connections to show that the, that it is held in different verbiage, uh, the same thing. It shows how they're using the analogs. Okay. So in this case, the flow of life. And if you, if you know the Tao Te Ching, the Tao, the, the way, the flow, the flow of life, how life experience is for you is based on what we have named and what we hold on to and what we hold inside of us. Um, Jesus is going to say that if you come to the altar to leave a gift and when you're there, you remember you have ought against your brother, set your gift down, go resolve the ought first, then come back and give your gift and your father who sees in secret will reward you in secret. We have to unfold these. It plays out in the mind that fits someplace. If I'm going to the altar to give um, a gift, that means I am looking for a better life. I am seeking. It's not okay. I'm looking for happiness. And I'm doing whatever I can. Please, I will do this. I'll do that. I'll try it. But there's an issue. It's not going to work because I'm harboring things in the past that are not resolved. This is saying instead of just keep trying to go after something new, quit trying to go after something new. Go resolve this stuff. Take care of the odd against your brother. Then come back and ask. And your father who sees in secret will will reward you in secret. You're now in the flow. (laughs) You're back in the Tao. All of these are going to be ways of holding that same teaching. The way we experience life whatever we call it or whatever whatever we think it is based on the shell that it is carried in is viable because it's there as a, we're from that energy field. We work in that energy field. The verses like this are obviously written in such a way though that it works if you use it in the physical world. I've, I've resolved my physical ought against people. I'm okay. Or if you take it to the mental the really in, inward part and leave nothing untouched and you realize the ought against your brother is that is that stuff you don't want to tell anybody about, that that is the real issue right there. And if you think that through, due to the multi-layer nature of it, if you've got some issue with neighbors or a coworker, something like that, and it just doesn't feel good, and you resolve that, it feels much better. And people would say, yep, that's it right there. That's only the shallowest use of the material. Once you put it where the brain is and where it attaches to energy, then life changes. All right, I'm going to jump to the rest of the template. 
Okay, back into it. Number eight, judged unchecked life experiences begin to be hidden deeply and we begin to lose our inner joy. Um, that, that, that's, um, let's talk about that one for a minute. What we're really doing is unbeknownst to us, we are seeing things in the physical world. And when we see that, we attach to it. I like that. I don't like that. Ooh, I hate that. I'm ashamed of that. We're seeing where that is how we live life. We all do that. That's a normal part of life. That's how we experience life. And then we become products of those experiences. At some point, if we're on a path, a part of the understanding to help one extract oneself from this is to understand that everything that we saw in the physical world happening, that's like the final fruits. We realize, oh, we attached to everything that was the final manifestation of energy and action. There was something driving what we saw. That evil person over there was treated like crap and they were just, they had, they're out of control. They weren't born evil. They were born a regular person that was, that was made that way. And we can't judge them based on what we see. We must understand that there's something deeper and underlying it in that for them and for us. But the number eight, judged unchecked, life experiences begin to be hidden deeply. This is really just us living without knowledge of that. The hurt stuff is there, but it's not just the hurt stuff. I mean, there anything, um, you know, I, childhood experiences are not all bad. We become products of all of those things and not all of that is, a, is an issue. Really later on in life, what we're going to be looking for is how to detach from the things that are hurtful to us, the cyclical pain. We move on to nine, our early self emerges, highly mentally attached to the physical experiences. Yeah, we become products of our life experiences, what we run into, the people, the relationships, our jobs, all of that, how we attach ourselves, that we kind of fit, we, we blend we may not stand outside of it. We can be a part of it without being attached to it, but typically we attach to it. And I, by that, I mean mentally. Number 10, the next issue, because we're on a path here of healing, is that cyclical pain emerges. The attachment to the physical is complete. We live life now just completely living day to day based on what what comes at us. Um, number 12, time goes by. Now think back on life and when you first got hurt, things were not a big issue, but as time went by, left unchecked, more and more happened, you saw more and more things, it actually grows and escalates. Time goes by, it gets bigger. Time goes by and left unchecked, whatever we harbor gets bigger and bigger within us till at some point it, it, it can be a monster. Later on in life, you're screaming and acting out that it has manifested to that, to that size. 13, life has become out of sorts. We're frazzled by our development and not knowing how to fit in with our world. We are getting ready to emerge from our physical beginnings. This is a path that certain people are going on. There are many people out there that are just not on this at all. They're not confused about life, even though they're living a life I would not choose. We'll click on and take a look here. The stories are separately traveling by word of mouth. That's important because we'll look ahead. A certain kind of person is selected out early on by being born that way. And in this template, a self-healing sequence is established. This is what we must do to interact with our past to heal ourselves. Okay, so there's that selected person. And I want to talk about that for a second. That is just a certain, I believe that when it goes back to being born with a certain brain type, that it's established back there that there's a certain brain type that's going to do this, that can see it, that can work it out conceptually, but also that somehow, I mean, there's just a lot of qualities that have to be there. That's th This video is not about that. So let me go on and take a look again here. Then we have, um, so after we get the selected person, you're going to see that there's also a cause and effect and the cycles of pain. And that's what I wanted to talk about. The stories are separately traveling by word of mouth. You have to, if, if the story is going to be working in such a way, if it's a puzzle, and it needs to have all of the pieces in there for it to work. You have to put cause and effect here and cycles of pain. Even though it was in creation, what we have to understand is they're not getting it all in one book. They're hearing individual stories by themselves. So it's like each one of them has to have all of the parts in order to work. So you will often see that. I don't know that it's always there. Um, there's a little bit of flexibility in some of this stuff. Not everybody has that selected part. Sometimes it's just go. Here's how it works. <laughs> you know? And if you're the right person, you'll do it. And if not, you won't.
uh, time to begin the inward journey to your happy beginnings. This is where we need to go back and resolve our issues. We're not going to want to because it's going to be painful and it's going to hurt. We're going to have to face the things that we've been dragging that we do not want to face. We've come to a point where we realize that that stuff right there that we're bringing with us is our problem. We have to find a way to set it down. We're not going to want to. It's not going to feel good. We've been hurt and we hurt people and we got to resolve it till it feels okay or best we can. We're going to need the awareness of what to do in the mind in the first place. This is a personal trip. So you have to know when you're in there, what is it that I have to do to, to make myself feel better then tell me what is it? So that has to happen. There's going to be a struggle to leave the past behind in this story. Um, There's going to be a turning inward to the mind. We'll see that as a crossing of the threshold struggle to leave the past. You would see that like if um, Pharaoh tells Moses to go, but then Moses chases after him. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, it, and he can't go to begin with. Plagues are happening. No matter what is, the cyclical pain is all going to be there. Anyway, turning inward to the mind. Uh, yeah, crossing the sea. Then we're going to be using our conscious and higher self to interact with memories and emotions to begin a process of healing. Face and work with the fears till they are no longer fears. The energy that we're holding the fears as, let me get this, the very nature of the energy of the fears, and we know the nature of them by the way they feel emotionally, is creating conditions for us to continue to experience that. So only in going back and changing our own, what we're carrying inside of us, a filter essentially, that we don't want to mess with, only by going back and dealing with that can we affect the change. Okay, um, then what happens here? We've got a share only with others that are of the same understanding. Yeah, there's a point where <clears throat> if you're in a group of people and you have all kind of share things, but you don't know that there's issues. I've been molested and I'm in a group of bunch of people that have been that way, but you're getting to the point where you feel, I mean, don't talk about it there. Um, there will be people around you, perhaps, that become hostile toward you, and it's not because of what you're doing. It's because of what they're hiding. It's because of what they are holding and because of what you are going to be representing. They, they might suddenly just lash out at you and call you names and all kinds of things. I've had that experience. It happened. It did happen. I believe it is in the material, though, too, to just kind of keep it to what you do is you talk. It does need to be talked out, but you find people that understand what is going on that aren't going to be hiding their own fears, that are going to be saying, yeah, I need to do the same thing. Let's talk until we feel okay, until we're like, yeah, eh, we're kids. Let's let's move on. You know, you have to figure out a way to make it that okay. That is when it quits hurting you. So you you don't want to talk to anybody, but you, you do want to talk to the right people. Life changes may occur, which are really big. We cease to fit the past and now need to be in an, uh, a new place to be. And for how long before growth sends us on, a, on another trek with the same result? If this is a lifelong adventure, often what you have is you get to a point of healing and you're just like, oh my God, I feel good. And life starts over. You're taking a break. You, you're in a new place. You find new people. You have new relationships. Things start again. And after time, after years go by, something changes again. And you might go, I have to grow beyond this. And there are going to be big steps that we may have to make along the way that are parts of the process. It's good to be, to remain alone, to know that that is going to happen if you're going to continue on the path. Although when you get done with something, you feel like, I feel so good. That's it. That was it. I'm done. Not until later do you go, okay, that was just one thing. (laughs) All right. What else do we have here? We, uh, I think I'm not clicking the right thing. Am I? We emerge back into life no longer the slave of our surroundings, but knowing we are observing the manifested effect of a deeper cause. Fighting the effect makes it bigger, so we back away. We can only change things by interacting with the energy of the cause. In plain language, we must change the way we feel about our memories to change the quality of our life and make changes along the way. And that's the template. Now... All right. Remember, (laughs) we're we're smart kids from 3,500 years ago trying to figure this out. Let's look at Exodus real quick. I'm going to pull this back up. There we are. Selected person, Moses. Moses was special selected. They show in this story by 
as an infant, he was saved in the basket. He was saved out from death, from being killed, by put in a basket and put in the river and raised someplace different. I'm not sure where they've got the cause and effect. Cycles of pain is going to be held in the um, the plagues, the continual plagues that come about. And there are cycles of pain. And there's also a, a struggle to leave the past happening right there because Moses wants to go. Pharaoh won't let him. God keeps hardening his heart. Happens over and over again. We're this put this in our own in our own psyche. Look at your past. I'm a certain person. There's cause and effect. I have had cycles of pain. It's time for to begin the inward journey to my happy beginnings. I want to get rid of the things, but I don't want to do that. Yeah, it's not it's not gonna feel good. I'm gonna need the awareness of what to do in the mind in the first place. Okay, what is happening with Moses? He's going to for the cycles of pain, that's happening. Time to begin the inward journey or to your happy beginnings. This is the calling. So he's up on Mount Horeb. He goes up to an elevated place, talks to God through the burning bush. Won't want, won't want to. God tells him you have to go. And he says, no, I can't. I can't even speak right. Needs the awareness of what to do in the mind first. So God is giving him answers. But how does he do this in a transformative way? Um, he gives him the staff. The awareness of what to do in the mind first. What do we have to do in the mind? We have to change the state of our memories. That's a transformative process. The staff is used to transform things in the story. So he's getting all of the supernatural aid. If you're looking at the other, you know, if it, this is not what um, Campbell has. He, Campbell does not have it identified to this degree right here. Joseph Campbell in the man with a thousand faces. So anyway, it's time to turn inward. Yeah, Moses there, the awareness to do that in mind. So he's getting all of that. He's getting the transformative tools he needs, the struggle to leave the past. Um, Pharaoh tells him he can go, and then he, then after a while he decides otherwise and, and chases after him. Turns inward to the mind, the crossing of the threshold, crossing the sea, using the conscious and the higher self to interact with memories and emotions to begin a process of healing. We are now in the... We are now in the desert for 40 years. 40 is going to come up as a number constantly used in the desert, days, years, something, something. <laughs> How long did the flood take to, to flood that out? It, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 is going to emerge as this number that you look at and go, oh, that's the time it takes from when you turn inward to cross the threshold to the time you emerge and go, okay, I've got it taken care of. I mean, that might be real quickly and it might be, who knows? How long does it take you to feel better about what hurts? 40. That's what that holds. 40 something says till the time it feels better. Anyway, then it goes on like that. You can see the pattern of the, of the material in that. And you can see it in Greek myth and other places as well, held in completely different analogous ways. Um, what I want to do is something right here, right now with, with a part of, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and then the, the beginnings of the story of Job. I'm not going to go very far into Job. Job is a different style. It's a fun-looking thing. I, I, I'd be curious to go after it. But I want to show you what I'm doing for analysis here. So let's go ahead and jump back to Genesis. And let's talk about Adam and Eve, naked, unashamed, in the Garden of Eden. What happens there? And then we're going to go take a look at Job and see how those are, component-wise, holding the same thing. And they don't sound like it. Sort of. It's close. It's not the same. Exactly. Okay, first what you see here is a, it's a screenshot actually from another video. But it, if you look at the number seven right down there where I have number seven, I begin accumulating a few other things I'll talk about here. You see, I've got a seven, a three, and I'm calling that pure unjudged life. Kind of you're carefree at that point in time. In the Bible, they're going to have things like from the east, uh, the Negeb. I'm starting to find places where they're creating analogs. Do you see where the seven and the three come from? First of all, let's go to creation. Okay, this is day seven of creation right here. Mine looks a little bit different, but uh, you'll recognize it. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Seventh day was said three times. So I'm going to say seven and three mean the same thing right there. Okay. Later on then, this seventh day right here is going to become representative of a number of things. 
It's going to represent that happy place before really getting attached to life. And that's going to be held in verbiage that the stories can go on and continue to refer back to that without it sounding like it's referring back to that. And here, take a look at this. This is down into Sodom and Gomorrah later on down the line. But take a look at where righteous comes in. And it's, it doesn't sound funny. What do you read it? I don't have this one modified yet. Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Not if there's 50 righteous, righteous. Right. Anyway, you count it out. Righteous appears seven times. So we're going to take righteous and put it on our list too. Okay, and here's the list. This represents day seven. That's our childhood before attached to physical life. And I think what they're doing is creating an analog pool so that they can begin to repeat the pattern and the template from this point without it sounding like the same point. So they're going to be creating different things through here, but they seem to be sequencing and letting us know what it is. So I've got the seven, the three, righteous. I got 50 in question mark because I'm not sure, and four in question mark because I'm not sure yet. But let's just start right there with that. And I will simultaneously make sure that we are looking at this point right here, that we are a male, our consciousness, our female, our subconscious. We're self-aware and happy at this point. Those two are together. We haven't had any bad experiences. We have open and honest qualities at this point at day seven, three, righteous, etc. All of those mean this same mental place right here. We are said to be empty, pure, devoid of, poor. Let's go look at Job for a second and do some interpretation. What I want to do is just talk about this first section, Job and his family, down to attack on Job's character. I'll just keep that first section up there. There once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, who feared God and turned away from evil. Let's stop right there and interpret. First thing I do here is identify the analogs. I've learned that there are nouns and verbs that they are using that mean something different in my psyche. So that's what I've done here in red as I've highlighted them already. The land of Uz. We've got a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. So we've got Job here identified, the land of Uz. The man is also blameless and upright. So there's two different things. Feared God. So we have to understand what God is too, and not just not just feared God, but what is God, and then turning away from evil. Those are that's what we have to identify before we can move on. We can't just look at this and go, well, that's a story. This is this is us. I'm Job. I am Job. I'm gonna go on my adventure. I'm a called person. This is a calling. I come from the land of us. But what is the land of us? I've mentioned on previous videos, I think some of the coding they're doing is like, if we had a couple of cities like Los Angeles and um, Las Vegas here in the United States, one of them is a nickname of the City of Angels and one has the nickname of City of Sin City. So you could use those and say, I'm traveling from one place to another, denoting that you're going from from an angelic place to a sin place or from a sin place to an angelic place nested in the idea that you're just going from one city to another. Us, I'm, I'm going to suspect is going to be that same sort of a thing. So I go look up um, on Wikipedia and I find that there's a, a location mentioned in the Old Testament, most prominently in the book of Job, which begins, there was a man, yeah. They're trying to figure out where it was. Um, location, it's been long debated if it's either in Abram or Edom. The Bible talks about it. There's a, other location possibilities. So they don't really know where us is. It's an unknown. However, I keep coming through here and looking, and I find something that says other interpretations. Some scholars hold that Uz is a fictional place to serve the story of Job rather than a physical land. The word of Uz in Hebrew means counsel or advice, which here suggests that the story takes place in the land of counsel. This fits the story, as the remainder of the book is a story about a man named Job who wrestles with his suffering and is counseled by several men and ultimately God. A similar conjecture. Okay, it goes on there a little bit. All right, do you see what just happened there, though? I'm looking at this going, okay, 
Uz means that me, Job, am in a land of counsel. I'm ready to do this. This is a mental process I'm going to work through. Okay, right now I just want to make a radical shift. Remembering that somewhere nested in here is a template that is based on the human life, and I'm using verbiage that I'm sure they did not use, but it would have worked the same for them. Okay, let's take a look at what we have here. Job, that's me, or you, the inner traveler, whoever takes this path. This becomes my guru. The land, that's my mind. That's where I... That's where I live from, my land. Us counsel advice. This is a mental process. Blameless. We desire to be unfettered. The called people don't like carrying baggage. It just bugs us. I have apologized to people before that said, get away from me. Who even cares? And we're sitting there going, I can't carry. I don't like this. We get bugged easily. We can't be fettered. Upright. We don't lie. That's a part of being fettered. We need to be, I, I don't like to. I want to be naked. I don't want to have to hold or hide anything. It just, it's too much to keep track of. Feared God was the next one. I split it out. Listen to feared. It's, it's not afraid. We're listening to. We have a connection with our higher awareness. That's our job is our consciousness. That's not just me. That's why I should change that. That is my conscious self. And God is my higher self. So I am Listen to the higher awareness. Feared God means that I am, when, when my higher self says, hey man, you got to resolve that, my inner self goes, okay, I pay attention to it, okay? But later, through life, we don't do that. We, we, we let the fear win, but we will listen to our higher self. We just have to know it's there and how to work with it. Okay, turned away from evil. Evil is the inner physical judgments. They're the things that hurt our life. Evil is not anything more than that. What makes your life evil from your land? And continuously throughout the material, that's telling us that what we have judged in life, we're trying to detach from the physical things that we've grabbed onto and try to rise above that so we are not so emotionally uh, hurt by it all. Okay. Um, turned away from, yeah, we, we turned, we want to get rid of that stuff. This is us right here. This is the called person. These are the qualities. Okay. Moving on. This should sound familiar. There were, I mean, in some ways there should be parts in here that get your attention. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. And you see, I've identified what I want to try to figure out what those are. And I've got the seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, perhaps. Greatest people of all the East, yes, but the servants, donkeys, oxen, camel. Yeah, I'm not quite sure on, on those. I'm going to go ahead and list them here, though. Seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 don donkeys, very many servants. And he was the greatest in all the East. So seven sons, what we're going to find out is, uh, number one, they're both analogs. Both of those words don't mean what they mean. Seven means what? Remember, we've established that early on. And sons is going to be the male, male part. Three is going to go back to that same point. Daughter is going to be the 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 female part. So this represents a hidden way of suggesting that back at that point where we were not hurt, or before we had begun to attach to life, that we're here. Now we've got something going on with 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. That's going to be pure qualities of something. They're going to represent something about us that I'm not sure what they are. We find it in other places. If we go to the a calling, for example, where Noah is getting on board the ark. There's two different callings there, but in one case, he's told to bring a pair of all animals. And then in another case, he's told to bring seven pairs of mating animals. So somehow this is going to fit into something like that, that, that you start out with pure qualities. And these other things, it sounds like a big story, but it really represents things like your joy, your peace, your innocence, your something along those lines. Very many servants. I don't know what that means. Lots of potential, lots of ways to go and grow. Greatest in all of the East. When we were kicked out of Eden, Adam was sent east of Eden. Now, I haven't established what yet, but east, north, south, west, all of those directions as they're doing things mean going a good place or a bad place. 
elevating up to a mountain is going to a higher, um, a higher place of learning, going up towards the, the higher awareness down into a valleys, down into the, the lower, just existing on life, planet earth, or, you know, connecting to the things that we see and just not even thinking it through, just jumping right in and being a part of it. Um, okay. I'm not going to get that, that detail as we continue on. What I want to do is take a, an overview. You can see how deep it gets. And we're still right here at the beginning of it. Okay. His sons used to go and hold feasts in one another how in one another's houses in turn, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Eating and drinking is experiencing life. We're consuming at a spiritual level. So we start out from pure beings. We are now going to con- start consuming and learning about life. And that would be our conscious and our subconscious as well. And after the feast had run their course, at the whenever we've learned things, Job would send and sanctify them. So as we're kids, we're learning things and we're being corrected and we're being taught and being told right from wrong in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned have accumulated things that hurt them and cursed God in their hearts and turned away. That would be in turning away from the higher being. This is what Job always did. So he's trying to maintain purity at a young age. Now we move on to the next section, attack on Job's character. And I'll just talk about this as we go through. Um, I'll, I'll quickly buzz over a few more sections and try to wrap up the video. If you're following along, you can see that it's not a fast thing to do. It's it, There's a lot to it, and I'm still trying to analyze it. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser also came among them. And the Lord said to the accuser, Where have you come from? Okay, what we have going on here is remembering this is somehow supposed to make sense in our life experience, in our psyche, in our brain, in our experience. So whatever the heavenly beings, that's something above us. That is life experiences that we're just going to give into. We present themselves before the Lord and the accuser also came among them. Think, um, think accuser of serpent in the garden of Eden, the, the, the life temptation. In fact, you think about that in Genesis, the temptation came from the serpent, which represents a creature that cannot get off the ground, no legs, no wings, no nothing like that. It's forever tied to the physical. It cannot rise above the physical. Here we have something that's saying, uh, having gone to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it, like it's been slithering on the earth too. They just described it going all over the place. Anyway, have you considered my, so this is just life temptation. It comes up and yep, there we go. And uh, so now life is going to unfold. What happens is that uh, all all this is representing is the idea that uh, this is like first sin just happened right there. Um, Then we have Job loses his property and children. One day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. So now we are consuming. Uh, oh, that's, uh, so have you, okay, so what happens is actually everything gets wiped out. He loses his family and all of his things. And then there is a... Um, what there is is this going back and forth of worship... Loss, temptation, loss. And again, I, I, I'm going to shorten this down. What we have there is now the repetitive uh, repetitive cycles of pain. And let's just take a look at where those were on the template, actually. We see number seven there. We begin mental awareness at our experiential life right here. So we had our three daughters and seven sons right there, starting out at, at point number seven, seven and three. Judged, unchecked, life experiences begin to be hidden deeply and we begin to lose our inner joy. We are starting to experience life along the way, and our early self emerges. Then the temptation comes and cyclical pain emerges. Attachment to the physical is complete. You see, it followed that same cycle right there. However, right there, it changes into something completely different where it goes into this dialogue. That that it's not, it does not, it doesn't, from here on, it starts out like, here's a, 
Here's how your life begins. But instead of it going on a hero's journey in the conventional sense, I think what it's going to do through this questioning and answering process is tell us how we came about and what we're supposed to do. It's going to be thick to get into it. Again, you can see it's, it's difficult. And I'm, Genesis is still where they're establishing all of these numbers and what the animals mean. At some point in time, you know, animals that we are having with us represents the things that we are physically doing in life. Our conduct, our actions, the way we talk to people, those are represented by some kind of creatures. Slaves would be something that we're carrying with us that we don't actually have slaves. We are slaves to them. They're, they're painful things that we carry, stuff that we're hanging on to. All of that begins to emerge in that way. But you have to turn it inward like that. But do you see, okay, there's the template in the beginning. And then here's how you can start seeing the pieces of the template and how it lines up. But it's conceptual. You have to read them conceptually. But also, if you're watching along and seeing what I'm doing, you see that there's something very simply structured in there. This is not magic. It's really just a matter of, it, it's like they've got some sort of a numbering and wording matrix going on in the background that if you find out what it is and make comparisons, you begin to realize it. It's like, here's the steps along the way. We want to repeat this as many times as possible while making it sound different every time while ensuring that all the the connections are still there. You don't just make up new terms. You decide that seven becomes three by saying it seven times and that righteousness becomes that same place by saying it seven times. Or you could say it three times or things like that. It's that simple what they're doing. As you read through here, just to me, it like it, it's like, why, why does that sound so weird that they're repeating stuff like that? And then as you start looking around and doing the fine function and all that, you begin to see, okay, okay, there's some, there's some very patterned behaviors that they have going on that is deeper than, you know, what we can see on the surface. Anyway, hope this is fun. You see, it's a puzzle about the life of a human. Um, yeah. Okay. Hope this video was interesting. Love one another. See you in the next one.